Yeah, from uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, uh, Biological Systems Engineering. I primarily do uh, uh, runoff water treatment facilities uh, for small and medium sized beef open lots. So, small and medium a APHOs under uh, 1,000 head. Uh, We've been doing quite a bit of it through vegetative treatment systems in Nebraska. But, uh, oh, back in 2008, crop prices are going up, um, forages were going up in price, and the feeders are really starting to do a lot of complaining on, on uh, production costs and really getting into some profit side for them. And uh, they kind of, a couple producers, they said, well, you know, what can we do to uh, uh, save some bucks, uh, make some money? on these feeder calves, well, you know, one of the things that's expensive is just having a feedlot. So with some of the, the technology that's out there today, and we've been using it for years, and, and uh, grazing systems and such, you know, uh, is it necessary to have these, these confined open systems? So uh, the feed calves without the feedlot, these are some things that we're going to want uh, because of it, you know, reduce costs by not having those infrastructures and pens the concrete, the steel, the watering systems, and, and all of that, uh, waste treatment facilities, uh, construction, and uh, it's just getting more and more inflated and more expensive, so we want to pay attention to that. Uh, anything with rubber tires or, or green or red paint is just so expensive to have, so if we can eliminate steps of baling, hauling, grinding, and spreading, uh, that's where we can start seeing some serious uh, uh, cost savings and labor, and labor's a biggie too. Reduce mortality and sickness in grazing operations, we hope. Uh, I've got some operations uh, that are permitted or they're already exempted at their certain size. That, you know, they'd have to do more paperwork or spend more money to add more pens, so maybe they want to expand without really uh, building that infrastructure. And in Nebraska, we've got so much surface water and groundwater in Nebraska, and everything's pretty much connected. The environmental risks based off of that is pretty important. So we're going to have all the creature comforts of a feedlot, but without the feedlot. And so we're going to want to house these cows calves using the permanent temporary fencing. And primarily we're going to be doing, um, my idea on this was into irrigated, center pivot irrigated forages, or crop residues. Uh, new materials, you know, poly wire, step in posts, uh, Gallagher's got the tumble wheel for cross fencing. Uh, we developed the A post and a pivot fence, and all those things can help uh, uh, reduce labor uh, and costs and, and, and things like that. Dust and mud, uh, dust is going to be a big problem for us this year. It has already been. Uh, mud, uh, if or whenever it starts to rain again. Uh, be able to leave uh, residue is also important. Uh, you know, we, we're going to leave this field ready to plant something into it the, the following spring or winter weed in, in the fall, so we want to make sure we've got plenty of residue for our no-till systems. Now I'm targeting our windrow grazing up to 90%. I know we can get to that point, and, and I'll show you with some of our case studies that we did. Uh, labor issues is a huge, huge problem, and it'll always continue to be a major problem in, in Nebraska <coughs> for us is labor. And then UNL, uh, Jerry Valesky and Aaron Berger did a, a great study about 14 years ago on window grazing uh, out of North Platte, and, and they got this NEP guide, and if you're interested, it's on the UNL publications. Um, just type in windrow grazing and this will come up. And it really went into uh, quite a bit of detail on, on a lot of the advantages of windrow grazing. Uh, but a lot of it is in, you know, we're eliminating a lot of pieces of machinery and, uh, uh, and that's where the, the, the big advantage is. So about, oh, I don't even remember what year it was, 2010 or somewhere in there, we uh, developed the, the pivot fence. Uh, I've got a, a an irrigated field that already has a, a, a structure out there that's movable, remote controlled. Uh, why not can't we use that as a, as a cross fence? So we start, uh, how can I make this center pivot into a cross fence? Do irrigated forages, windrow graze it, or a green crop, standing graze, and then take the calves or the cows to the field instead of taking the forages to the feedlot. So, <coughs> Windrow grazing, you know, if we've got quarter mile long pivots, uh, half mile long pivots, you know, we can uh, use it as a labor uh, reduction tool. Uh, 
Portable fencing, one of the problems with portable fencing is, uh, again, manually pick it up and move it, and when we get into frozen soils, it's not a lot of fun, you know. It's not even, so with the pivot, we can, we can do, uh, take care of this. It has to be simple and easy to install and remove, and no alterations to the pivot. It has to fit, Nebraska, we're lucky, all, the four major pivot manufacturers are in the state, so we want to be able to fit on all their makes and models, too. Kind of a plan view of it in uh, this dash line up here. Uh, we just put in a temporary <coughs> stationary fence. We put one on the outer perimeter. And when we're ready to give them their daily intake on, on windrows, we just move the pivot and we allow access to that on it. So, it, uh, so if we had uh, uh, Ford sorghum in here and we windrow it or oats or, or whatever it is, and then when they're ready to uh, to receive more forage. This way we can control their intake, their dry matter intake, which is one of those comforts of having a feedlot. And we can start um, uh, feed, uh, letting the, the calves feed themselves and, and help control their performance too. So this gives us a lot of control. Every time I hear those fire trucks, I wanna go pop on one, so <laughs> it's very distracting. So, so the three major components of the pivot fence is truss rod hangers, stripe pipe clamps, and a wire tensioning system. And that was actually the simplest thing to sol uh, solve, but it took me quite a while to figure out how to do it. And there's a long story behind that if you're ever interested. But uh, uh, and it has to do with the fire, too. So. But truss rod hangers, you know, uh, every tr uh, pivot, center pivot has trusses, so uh, that would be an obvious point that we could uh, make this a universal fit. Uh, we clamp them on. Uh, we have a vertical adjustment on a post, and then we got an insulator down here. So we got sand hills, or you got big canyons, or whatever. Uh, pivot tracks go up and down. So sometimes we have to push the wire down, or sometimes we have to hoist the wire up, and, uh, and then use it between the tower spacing, and then have it easily to adjust. This is going to be a pressure point. This is where the calves, the calves are going to come up and graze. So we want to make sure that wire is uh, is doing its job. Here's just a uh, pipe clamp over the uh, we built uh, with an insulator on it. This helps it from uh, grounding out on the drive motor or the drive pipes. Like I said, this is kind of our simple thing. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we got ice and snow. Uh, we got uh, calves right there. Uh, the pivot is going to be going like this throughout the field. Uh, we had to protect the integrity of that wire uh, without snapping. So basically, we come up with a, uh, it's a hundred pound load uh, garage door spring with a five dollar uh, cam strap on it. And we can get five or six feet of stretch or contraction on this too. And that really helps, and it's up, we use it at the pivot point where the control panel is, so uh, the, the producer can, in a matter of seconds, can set the tension on that wire as he's moving that pivot. So we did two grazing, well we did two grazing trials in each year, in 2011, 2012. Uh, irrigated wheat, we chased it with fall oats, and then we grazed the oats. Uh, and then we did a corn stock one in 2011, and in 2012 we did basically the same thing. Uh, uh, it was a little complicated on this 2011 fall oat one because uh, Dwayne started drilling it on the eighth, on, a, on the half of the pivot, and then we got, he got a little rain, and then it took four days before he could get back in there. But it did give us two significant yields, uh, almost uh, eight tenths of a ton on dry matter reduction just by that four day period. It was kind of, uh, strange but just because of that you know if you weren't so lazy and you would have drilled the whole field <laughs> you could have had the whole field at that $25 range and uh, uh, but still it worked it was great and worked well we did lose a little bit in uh, the windrows on quality but it was still pretty good forage we weren't uh, that um, sad by that uh, we ran about, uh, we had some cat, uh, yeah. we averaged 328 feeders uh, for 53 days on that south half. Uh, Dwayne uh, raises a lot of corn and uh, pinto beans and great northerns, so uh, he wanted to spend time harvesting, not messing with his calves. So he did do check and inspect and check the water, uh, but he did not want to get in there and start wind drawing like I wanted him to. I'm like, well, that's okay. So. He just grazed it standing up, and this was at 2.8 ton per acre, so it's pretty heavy oat. 
And they ended up lodging quite a bit of it by pushing a lot of it down or going after some volunteer weeds. And so we only got half of it. Well, okay. Dude, that's just that much residue that's there for his corn crop the following year. Is it because you're so dry you can windrow and leave it lay out there forever or what? Yeah. If I did that, it'd be a rotten mess. And if, okay. yeah, and it's just like hay. And, you know, we used to do a, a lot of stacking, you know, cage stacks and, and uh, slide stackers and things like that. And uh, you put a windrow up right and you rake it together. It's basically a stack instead of a five ton stack being 20 feet high, it's a mile long. And it sheds the water, and as long as you've got the minimum much touching, it'll stay cured quite a while. But if you're in a 30 inch rainfall area like eastern Nebraska, I, I don't think I'd do it. But uh, and, uh, this was down on the Colorado border. Uh, most of, the, of Nebraska and High Plains country, I would feel. Um, really really good about it but if it's cured before it starts snowing or raining on it, it it'll really keep but if, it, if it's just is like bailing if it's uh, you layer down and you get a bunch of rain on it yeah it's gonna it's gonna decay rapidly oh, hard drugs. <laughs> ah, yeah that is distracting Oh man. Okay, uh, but look at our prices per head per day. Now that is just the forge and his labor and the fencing. That is not the land values. We did not disrupt his crop rotation. So I had a struggle. I just kind of kept the land out of there just to kind of keep things even. Forge intake at 13 and a half a day. And Dwayne just did a, a move of the fence every three days. So there's uh, the calves out there. Uh, this is in that 2.8 ton oat. Uh, you can see the oat. You can see the oat uh, over here heading out on the south half of that field, and the north half it's not. So there's your difference in part of the yield. This was taken, I think, um, third week of October. The calves go right up underneath the, right up underneath that wire, and, and once oh, they, they get the best part then. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, once they get trained on hot wire, uh, you can cut the power off. I mean. Once they, they'll know how to do it, and they'll get within hair length of just how far that snapper will get them. But you can see how well they're lodging back in here. They did go back and clean some of it up, but not, not as, as well. <coughs> North half, we windrowed it. Uh, we, I think uh, Dwayne did it the, uh, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, we grazed 83% uh, of it is what we picked up. So it did much better. Uh, our price per head per day is a little higher. But that, that was a lower yield on that side of the field, but our, when we went to dry matter on uh, a dry crop to graze or dry forage, our, our uh, intakes went up. And those calves really popped. They really did well on it. Uh, uh, they were just uh, heifers to breed, so it wasn't looking uh, if to uh, gain in a lot of weight on them. So they were just grazing. On the, on the left, the calves are sitting there waiting for that pivot to move. and. Uh, and they just sit there patiently and they just stare at it. And they'll hear the motors start turning and, uh, and they uh, get really excited. It, it is everybody I took out here to this, you know, it's like, oh, look at, there's the, the fence and here's the windrows, but er, the, the calves turned into a bunch of comedians and they were so much fun to watch their behavior. There's about 350 of them. That's a 1,500 foot long pivot. It's nine towers in Matic. and Matic. Uh, a portion of them figured out that tower eight, seven, eight, and nine move faster than tower one, two, three. Yeah. But some of the stubborn ones over here, did they just they wait probably 20 minutes before a windrow would open up. They had they were very patient. But everything else, when it turned on, all most of those calves would just start hauling to the other end. So where where do they water? <coughs> Water. They go all the way back around, and we have just one water source on the place. Okay, but do you get a lot of compaction traffic no. or anything there? They They'll cut one path, okay. maybe two. Um, not that bad. You have even forage, you're going to have even manure. No. Calves poop where they eat, so do cows. So uh, it was. You, we knew it was going to happen, but uh, when you see it, it was very impressive. It was very, very, uh, you, we couldn't have mechanically spread manure any better than what those calves did. So this year we did it, uh, drought, uh, water allocations. So we only did a 1.8 ton per acre on the yield. 
Uh, Dwayne got lazy on me again. He did not want to windrow it. And uh, so we left it standing up. It uh, hurt our, our, our utilization a little bit at 67%. Uh, he was supposed to get me his production costs this year, but you know, he's working on it. So I didn't have him ready for you today. And we moved the, he moved the every other day again. But if you notice this year, we did have snow. We had about a foot and a half of snow out there, but it did not affect their quality whatsoever. So. When did you start grazing this year? November 6th. You started November 6th. And he pulled off uh, his last move of the pivot was January 18th, but the calves, uh, he just laid the fence down and they were grazing corn stalks on the next field next to it. So they did kind of come back and do a little picking in there. But, uh, but anyway, it's some good days out there. There's the oak. Now the corn stalks really didn't make anything a big science project out of this one. We just kind of wanted to see, is it useful to uh, stretch the, uh, the overconsumption of grain the initial few weeks the cows are out there and have them have grain all the way through our grazing period. We want to reduce supplement on the protein, so that's, <coughs> that's what we did. This year we had one field that had 40 bushel on the ground because of a you know, freak 80 mile an hour windstorm. And uh, uh, so we wanted to see, can we use it effectively on calves to prevent some founders from overconsumption. So last year, or 2011, we did 90 cows for 90 days. We moved that pivot 10 times. Um, they grazed corn, grain every day that 90 days. And it was it was just fantastic. It was a great winter to graze corn stalks. And this was in Torrington, Wyoming. Uh, and the producer did not have to buy one one supplement protein at all, one pound that year. Uh, 210 bushel corn on irrigated did really good. So a lot of trash, a lot of leaves and husks out there, and it did really well. This was uh, that last move, and the cows are out there, and uh, you see a lot of husks and a lot of leaves still out there. The cows did well. Their body condition score probably went up one, one point. So they gained a lot of weight. Uh, this year, it did not work near as well as planned. We thought we were uh, pretty uh, smart, and we know what we're doing, but actually uh, uh, we got educated by these calves. Uh, they were pretty rangy calves that just come out of a feed yard. Uh, uh, we probably didn't have the world's greatest uh, placement of the uh, stock tank. We, uh, it was down at the pivot point, and it gave a little pitched area uh, on the wire, and the calves didn't quite respect the wire like they should. And, it, it, and then we were in a very, about as rough as you can get sand hill uh, crop field. And uh, it became at, when it, we get, the pivot moved into, it worked great up until the point where we got in a really rough spot and a producer kind of gave up on it because of, of the labor issues. And, uh, but up until that point, it worked well. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, there is a limit to uh, rough ground. And, and I think we got some ways that we would have done differently that would have helped and, and minimized that, that kind of a problem. So as long as we're learning, we're good. So we do know that we can successfully have these cows uh, on portable fencing and temporary fencing. That's not a problem. We do that all the time. We've done for years. If we hay it properly and allow it to cure, that quality can really uh, hang in there. In, in a high plains country in Nebraska, it most definitely can uh, on, these, on these forages. If we can minimize the windrows by raking them, we think we can get to that 90% grazing utilization if we want to. But keep in mind, we don't always want to take everything out of there too. We want to keep some residue. Uh, if we can do it daily on, uh, use wireless controls, use your iPads and move that pivot, then we can prevent some overconsumption, control our intake. Manures naturally spread, and that's always a good thing. On calves, especially on some of these ranchy calves, I think we'd, we would introduce them in small groups, uh, bring them in for a few days, and then bring another load in, and kind of let the, the ones that have been there a while educate the new calves. And uh, we do a little bit different on stock tank uh, uh, placement, and, and just have a little different initial approach to it because the behavior of the calves, I, you know, I thought, okay, you know, we're gonna have some human interaction, uh, more human interaction than a feed truck zipping right past them. Uh, so we knew that their behavior was gonna change. I didn't realize how well they were gonna, or how, you know, have you ever been around 750 bucket calves? 
and try to get out of the gate by yourself. It, yeah, it's a 30-minute process. If you want to know, uh, I took uh, Jared Vleski with me out there, and I said, uh, "Whatever you do, don't leave the doors open on the pickup." He goes, "Why not?" Uh, because they'll come inside, and they did. And uh, univer thank God University Motor Pool did not have a camera out there seeing a 600-pound heifer inside of the pickup. <laughs> Brand new Chevy pickup. So, um, But uh, th their behavior within days, D Dwayne going out there, driving to the pinner point, open up the control panel, and their calves are all just happy, and they go take their spot out there when that pivot starts to move. And that's that little interaction really changed her behavior. And it got to a point, now he just drove these cabs there. Uh, they're two miles away. This one this year was three miles away. And he just drove them back and forth. We didn't set up any, any uh, pans or corrals or anything. Uh, he just drove them back and forth. And, and that last time he did it, I think he did it twice, that second time he did it, uh, he just opened a gate and the calves just walked home, 400 head. So uh, the uh, their behavior and the disposition was, was a huge component that that was very impressive for us, so we enjoyed that. But uh, I got questions, or we've got time for one quick question. Were you happy with the gains on those calves in that support system? Uh, we were looking at Brett Heifer, so he was only one 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 to one and a half pound per head gain, so he didn't supplement him any energy or anything, and so yeah, we were, he was happy with that. Uh, we haven't done it with feeder calves where we did want to push our ADGs or anything, but we know that we can do it if we want to. Okay, thanks.